Yeah, that was old fashioned, Sally. Man can cook and all, you know. I'm not old fashioned. I'm not old fashioned. One of my daughters is LGBTQ. Not sure of those things. Well, if I were cooking, it'd be cheese on toast. Well, I'm a very big fan of a weeping Stilton. Gets stuck in your teeth, though, doesn't it, cheese? Well. And she's got falsies. <laughs> no, I haven't, Timothy. I've not got falsies. The talk of the street. 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 Welcome to episode 306 of The Talk of the Street, an unofficial Coronation Street catch-up podcast that reckons Bethany has stormed out the builder's yard flat more often than Craig's unplugged the cooker. I'm Gavin. And I have an aversion to mouth poop. We all do. Mice or mouth poop? <laughs> what is mouth poop? I don't know. But I'm curious. Is it diarrhea of the mouth? <laughs> like when people talk too much and they never shut up? Could be. I think that works. <laughs> We have an aversion to that. Yes. Despite the fact that <laughs> we both that's do pretty it. much what we're doing right now. <laughs> What's your mouse poop story? Well, as as you know, because I talked about it last week. Yeah, but I'm pretending that I don't know. Right. Well, to encourage you to tell our listeners. Right, and that's it, who I also told last week. But please interrupt me again. <laughs> as you know from last. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Gav. Poor, poor Gav. Anyway, as I mentioned last week. Oxy talk! <laughs> Fucking asshole. Yep. <laughs> you are lucky I love you. Get one. We're in a hurry. Well, then stop interrupting me, you jackass. Oh, call immigration on you or something. I've got all the necessary paperwork. <laughs> and if I'm going down, I'm taking you with me. <coughs> oh, dear. Yes, so I had to go to Holland to look at books on Thursday. Not the country. Not the country, Holland. Holland, Michigan, which is lovely and has a tulip festival and is filled with people of Dutch ancestry. So I feel right at home. You know, I get to the house and it's nice. And the the son of the deceased homeowner takes me on a tour of the first level and then the second level and then the attic. And in the attic, there are a couple of trapped birds that have somehow gotten into the attic. Oh, dear. But there's also a lot of mouse poop, like on top of boxes of books, on the floor around the books etc. And I'm like, well, I'm going to start here because this is an attic and I don't want to be here in the afternoon when it will be very, very hot. And I was correct in that because I ran up there for a second before I left later on mm. and it was like a sauna. It was terrible. Or a sauna. Yeah. Same thing. So, so yeah, my, my day started with dodging mouse poop and trying to dust mouse poop off the tops of boxes so that I could open the boxes and stuff. It was fun. It doesn't I, sound like it. If, yeah. It, it started off kind of not fun. But by the end of the day, you know, I'd found some interesting things that I think we can help the family with. And, you know, that's the best part of my job is... Selling mouse poop. <laughs> what my bed for mouse poop? Mm. I don't know. You've got I don't even. Of it. It's going to be worth something. You'd have thought. I don't even know if it's worthwhile to use this fertilizer as a number of other kind of poops do, like horse poop and cow poop mm -hmm. and human poop. You'd have to. You'd have to have a lot of mice producing poop all the time. Well, don't they kind of pee all the time? They're generally always peeing and pooping. There you go. 
So, but still, their poops are small. They're little, little, little teeny, teeny, tiny. I can imagine. Mice are generally small. Little teeny, tiny, tiny. They'd be kind of weird if they did human-sized shits. Yes. It was hilarious because when I was up there. This is a Coronation Street podcast. Because <laughs> I was when I was up there uh, with the son, who also met his wife online, although very much differently because it was Match.com and not a, a writer's forum. So, um the first box I opened that was like right at the top of the stairs when we were talking, I opened it up and guess what I found? Porn. <laughs> it's got to be porn. It was. Yay. It was the old man's porn. What was his uh, Piccadilly? I, I didn't. I didn't really. Did you get a name of hard. any of the mags? No, because I just I saw boobs and I shut it, you know, because the sun's right there. And I've. Maybe it was a sun stash. Probably not. And, you know, I've told you this story before, but when I was a young child, I found my parents' copy of Joy of Sex underneath <laughs> their sink in their bathroom. And when I opened it up, Polaroids fell out. So I don't ever... I don't think I remember the Polaroid, but... I don't ever, ever, ever... What to put a child in that sort of situation, even Good if he God. is in his forties, because <laughs> it scarred me for life. Oof! I don't think I want to know any more. <laughs> I mean, of my parents. Um, <laughs> the confirmation that nobody needed. Anyway. Anyway. Let's keep... So yeah. It, it it was an exhausting week driving all around the state, oh, and I'm glad I'm glad it's over. Good stuff. Shall we preamble, my dear? Yes, please. Give us some of that pornographic Cody news. Yee. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. To, to Sam Aston and wife Brioni as they welcome baby number three, Hazel, who joins Big Brother Sunny, who is three, and Big Sister Daisy. Who is 18 months. That's right, folks. Three children under the age of five. God bless them. And please, please, Sam, no more. <laughs> Wait until at least one of them's over five. Sam, I think Helen's got a box of literature she might be able to sell you. Just to <laughs> save Brian from any further loss of iron. Let's put it that way. Yes. Yes, very much so. I remember having two under five, and that was bad enough. Oof. You probably sort of remember that as well, at least briefly. Yeah. Was that fun? That was brief. Mr. Gav, I have pooped my pants. <laughs> Not mouse poop either. No. <laughs> that was human poop. It was. You could have sold that. And to Dex Saturday Night Takeaways, first episode featured our beloved Jody Pranger. What? Yes, I have no idea what that is, but I'm sure it's impressive for Ant and Deck to have landed such an icon for their little game show the segment. The game show? There was a game show segment that she was oh, on. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think I maybe saw the first series of Ant and Deck's Saturday Night Takeaway. And Which just a, ended. The first series? No, no, the last series. Right, and there was a section that called Win the Ads. Yes. I think. That was it. Where you win, so they said, I don't think it was... So that you were actually winning what was shown on the ads, but that was the, the general principle. So Jodie, Jodie was on that. Did she win? Mm-hmm. Good for her. She won all 25 items. Very nice. Yeah. Proving that she's smarter than both Ant and Deck. She knew that Deck was the oldest of the two of them. That was like the last question. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, 50-50 chance, right? <laughs> and finally, Harriet Bibby has hinted that she has left Boston Common and is headed back to the cobbles. She's packed up her tent. Maybe. Oh. Or maybe, since obviously Harriet isn't camped out in America in a tent on Boston Common. Yes, yeah, that, that is at not the a moment. Thing. She was just enjoying Well Being Day on set with her family, with the rest of the cast on Well Being Day. It's not like she actually moved to America, folks. Let's let's maybe let's maybe cool it. With these ridiculous articles. Isn't it funny, though, how quickly you kind of forget where the character stops and the actor starts? Yeah. 
because the idea of her not being in Boston kind of took me by surprise a little bit. <laughs> of course she's not in Boston. We had trouble accepting that her character was going to be in Boston, right. let alone yeah. Harry Bibby Especially herself. Especially since Boston Common University does not doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. That's does why we exist. said the University of America. Right, yes. So she's coming back. Well, maybe. Well, we think. Maybe. It's possible. She's or to come maybe. Back. Well, yeah, she'll come back eventually. But maybe not. It was you know. Three months she was soon. away for a thing, wasn't it? Or six months? She was supposed months. to be away for a year. No, it was the last term that she was going for. She was supposed to be gone for a year, according to the article I read. No, that's wrong. Because, as you know, the colleges end. Yes. Some Relatively faster soon. than others. Yeah. <clears throat> That'll be good. I'll be glad when she comes back. <clears throat> yes. Yes. I really did like Summer when she wasn't constantly falling over and trying to sell non-existent babies to people. Right, yes. Although, you know, Boston is quite lovely this time of year. So, Harriet, if you're looking for vacation spots... Not that she's there. No, but if she wanted to go to Boston in the springtime, it is lovely. There we go. And that's Corey News. That's Corey News, which leads us as, as if it was planned by a deity onto our feedback section that I like to call... Everyone's a critic. Mark writes in, I hate to be Mr. Pedantic here, Gavin, but Around the World with Willie Fogg was a fundamental part of my childhood on Children's BBC, and it was most definitely a Spanish production. (laughs) Australian indeed. (laughs) Thank you, Mark. I quickly figured that out shortly after saying that last week. We all make mistakes sometimes. We do. And you know, all I could tell was it wasn't British. <laughs> so it could be anything. Thomas writes sense to say, Michael and Glenda would actually be quite cute the more I think about it. Make that happen, please. Well, we'll, we'll get right on that. I did think, as we were talking about it, it was funny because mm-hmm. you'd mentioned it and I wasn't really giving it much thought. No. And I thought maybe just Michael appeared or happened to be... Right, he happened to be on, on set, set, so... But the two of them were together again this week. Yes. And I think I might agree. Yeah. I think, is, is he a good bit younger than her? I think so. Yeah. Because George is her yeah. brother. Yeah. And they are close enough to, in age to have grown up together. Mm-hmm. I don't hate the idea. It Rose. wouldn't be the worst pairing Coronation Street has ever done. No. I could name, I, I have like five in the top of my head might, right now. We might talk about some other ones this week. Which I will not mention. Then Sarah writes, I really laughed a lot listening to you talk kids TV theme tunes. Have you heard this one? Thought of you when I remembered it. It's Albert the Fifth Musketeer. Do you remember this? No. I don't think we got this. It was about this guy called Albert, who was the fifth musketeer. Fifth musketeer, yes. It's nice of the show to remember that there were four musketeers in the three musketeers. Yeah. Everybody forgets D'Artagnan. Or Dog Tanyan. Again, the tune really made me laugh. This was a British, French, Canadian production. I remember this vaguely. This was on when I really was too old to be watching children's TV. But I remember the tune. Really? Because that does not sound like you were too old for it. I was in my 20s, definitely. Really? Because mm-hmm. that sounds like 70s or 80s British, TV. French, Canadian. Yeah, I watched British, French, Canadian, other stuff like... Um, well, like um, Degrassi, which I mentioned Drake was in. Okay. But anyway, yes, that sounds that sounds delightful and very, you know, marchy and... I particularly like the horn, yes. Yeah. Ian Les Paul writes in, You asked about first memories of Corey watching. I, like Gavin, was in the room when it was on during a lot of my childhood. My mother followed it religiously. I would be pushing cars around the carpet, secretly listening. I remember being somewhat traumatised by one episode where there was a ghost haunting the street. The show was in black and white in them their days, and they managed to create quite a convincingly spooky tale. I think it turned out that all 
the roof spaces had no dividing walls between them, so it's possible to access all of the houses from the attics. The roof was continuous. Someone was playing a prank and or burglaring made an impression on a five-year-old. Thank you very much, Ian Liz Paul. I think I vaguely remember seeing something yeah, like that, but ghost. that was maybe a little bit before my time. And yet, still no aliens or chimpanzees on the show. No. Still, still falling behind the American soap. Maybe next week. <laughs> English Victoria writes, Hi, lovely Helen and Gav. Thank Aww. you for the continued awesomeness every week and all the time, love and effort that goes into making something so fabulous. Well, thank you very much, English Victoria. Yes, thank you. I mean every week to get back in touch, but then mum life takes over and fade to black. My normal life. But I did want to get in touch to share a few thoughts. Number one, whilst I'm happy that Liam is getting therapy, I'm sorry, but even going privately would not get things moving that fast. Mm. Yeah, I kind of... Yeah. Agree with that. Yeah. Totes unrealistic, even though money makes the world go round and all that. Number two, my favourite childhood show was the epic Poddington Peas. Remember Poddington Peas? I think that's very British. It is very British, but it, it, there's something about the name that feels familiar. I still got the Peas theme tune popping my head from time to time and it always makes me smile. Well, here we go. Here we go. I hope there's no vulgarity in this. <laughs> Give peas a chance, Gav. Down at the bottom of the garden, this sounds very 80s. Among the birds, and the birds and the bees. What rhymes with birds and the bees? Lots of people. Poddington Peas. <laughs> oh, what rhymes with please? Hello, hello, hello. What's all this? Well, there we go. Point, that's a rather jolly tune. That is a rather jolly tune. So yeah, English Victoria says, I still get the peas theme tune popping in my head from time to time and it always makes me smile. Makes me smile. Though I did have a huge fear of eating peas as a young child. Uh-huh. It doesn't take an expensive therapist to work that one out. Hmm. Lastly, number three. One day there should be a mighty meeting of all your UK listeners. I imagine that would be fabulous fun. Back to mum duties now. Toodle pip. Thank you very much. English Victoria. Yes. I imagine mushy peas was a, were especially traumatic. <laughs> mushy Poddington peas? Yes. Oh my God. Oh, the carnage. It's like a massacre of peas. Is it just me or did Bernie being in a real world house remind you of when Homer Simpson accidentally ventured into the 3D world? <laughs> it was quite weird seeing Bernie walk up to a regular house on a regular street. Right. And walk in. And the same happened with... Stu, when he used to do it, remember he would knock on doors and they would slam the door in his face? Yes. That was just weird seeing somebody like walk up to just a regular mm-hmm. house. I remember that episode of The Simpsons. That was a Treehouse of Horror episode, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. Homer Cubed, yes. I think it was called. Nicky writes, and I'm he, a- found, he found a pornographic bakery, <sighs> if I remember correctly. I don't remember that. He's terrified and then he's like, ooh, pornographic bakery. I don't remember that. <laughs> Nicky writes, I'm a newish listener to your podcast. I've been watching Corey for years, although my early memories are a bit patchy. I remember David's dad getting stabbed. I remember that too. And my next memory is of Raquel learning French with Ken. I loved that. Have you ever looked at a floor plan of Coronation Street and wondered where are the toilets and the rovers? They seem to be in Ken's house. Also, <laughs> Eddie built a downstairs toilet, which is also in Ken's house, pretty much where Ken sits in his chair. Later's Nicky from Exeter in the UK, another UK listener. Yes, that's very nice. And then finally, Cheeky writes, I'm really glad that Nathan got beat up. I'm pretty sure that the culprit was David. Will we find out tonight? Ooh. Some confirmation of that. Yes, which is hilarious because, it, like, when I was reading Corey News and stuff, there were, like, all these articles insisting that it was a woman, that everybody thought it was a woman. Oh, really? Is it a woman? I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. I also don't feel bad for Bernie about the whole lost child thing. Most of this is because she only recently started doing right by her kids and every other time was just trying to make a quick buck. So my opinion of her is not the best. I think we catch Cheeky in a rather grumpy mood about poor Bernie. They're not wrong. They're not wrong because when we first met her, let's remember, she sold her daughter's pregnant pee. Poddington pee? (laughs) Yes. Feedback is always welcome. Send us your thoughts and I will probably read them out. Get us at the talk of the street at gmail.com or our DMs are open at Corey Podcast. Please note that we reserve the right to edit feedback, but all in the interest of brevity. And thank you this week to Chicky, Nikki, Trisha, 
English Victoria, Ian Les Paul, Sarah, Thomas, and Mark. Whew. That's a lot of people. What a lineup. Yeah. And now we'll podcast for coffee. We're buying their own coffees this week. What? All those people wrote in and not a single one of them bought us a coffee? I think most of those people continually buy us coffees. Well, yes, they are friends of the podcast. Friends of the podcast, etc. The talk of sheet is and will always be free on your podcast provider and on the YouTubes. But if you think a show is worth anything more than the time it takes to listen to it, if you want to show your appreciation, you can buy us next week's coffee by going to ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. You can also sign up to be a friend of the podcast through the same link, where for as little as two bucks a month, you can get a mention in the closing credits of each and every episode. And remember, you can always support the podcast for free. Get us in front of new listeners by liking, subscribing, rating and reviewing wherever you get your podcasts. Shall we dive in, my dear? Yes, please. Our first storyline this week is Secret Baby of the Week. <sighs> well, we had Secret Baby of no, the Week. No, no, no. A couple of weeks ago. No, no, no. You're, you're not wrong. Still, it feels like maybe one too many Secret Babies just floating around out there. Don't... The living and the dead. Don't the... <sighs> The people who are storylining this. Mm-hmm. Don't they think Don't they maybe talk they should to each other? spread out the secret babies a little bit more? Secret babies are very in this season. Are they? Sure. I, I also It also kind of feels like we're coming back into a season of trauma dumping starting this week. On Bernie? No, just in general. Oh, just in general. It just feels like we're getting an awful lot of tragic stories over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And the only relief we get is Steve. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that. Hmm. Anyway, on Monday, Bernie has got up early doors but stands on a squeaky toy as she's trying to sneak out. So she lies to Gemma saying that she's off to Freshco's early doors. Gemma relates this to Paul and they both agree that her behaviour is sus but more than that, Paul knows that Fresh goes is shut due to a power failure mm. makes a change from burst pipes Yes, Gemma, how are they keeping all that meat cold, one would, one would ask Yeah, Gemma tries to call her and Bernie insists that she's at the checkout so Gemma goes to tell Dev who promises to speak to Bernie about it knowing that Bernie has been under a lot of stress recently of course she has so he goes to see her and she sticks by the Fresh goes line until Dev threatens to speak to Denny because he reckons that that's what's at the heart of all this. Right, yeah, it's like Denny wants to speak to you, Dev. So Bernie has to confess that Toya's had a secret baby. Oh no, that she's had a secret baby. Yeah. And his name was Zodiac. So that along We've with solved- Apollo and Gemini, they could start their own rival to the gladiators. Finally, we've solved the mystery of the Zodiac killer. It was Bernie's son. Apollo, ready! Zodiac, ready. You will go on my first whistle. British gladiators, folks. To murder lots of people and write mocking notes to the police. And also exonerate Ted Cruz's dad. We are riffing on completely different things here. We are. And that's great banter. It is. It is. It's interesting to see... How the word Zodiac sparks completely different things in the minds of an American and a British well, person. Well, it's really Zodiac in conjunction with Apollo and Gemini that, that does it for me. Hmm. Zodiac, or Zach, was the result of an affair that Bernie had when she was with Denny. And she wasn't good enough to be his mum, so he was taken off her and ended up in care. Which really kind of confused me. I was, so, so at this point, I was like, okay, so... This child is older than Paul That's and Gemma well. because they wouldn't just take one child off of her. Mm. They'd take them all. The package deal. Right. She discovered that his adopted parents have called him Christopher Green, so she's been trying to track him down. Dev sympathises, but worries that this is actually all about Paul and maybe Christopher Green won't want to see her. But Bernie has made up her mind. So off she goes to fancy house. You think, Dev? So off she goes to fancy house. You think this is about Paul? In the suburbs and meets the latest Christopher Green on her list who assumes that she's his new cleaner. Bernie plays along and when his back is turned, she roots around in his drawers. Not like that. Not like that. 
She gets caught, of course, and he's about to call the cops when she comes clean. She wasn't on the rob. She's looking for her long-lost son in those drawers. She explains her story, but he tells her that he's not adopted. Bernie apologises for wasting his time, tips her hat, and leaves him to it. But he obviously is the Christopher Green that she's looking for. Yes. Bernie goes home and Gemma immediately pounces on her, demanding to know who the fuck Christopher Green is and dropping her memory box onto her lap. Bernie is fucking furious that Gemma went digging in here and snaps that he was the love of her life. Confused, Gemma goes to see Paul and the two of them think this is weird but not impossible and given Paul's situation that explains Bernie getting a bit maudlin, Gemma decides to track down this Christopher Green which should take 15 minutes tops. Bernie chats to Dev who tells her to forgive herself but she confesses that Zach wasn't taken off her as she said to start with. Bernie begged them to take him away despite her already having the twins. Yeah. Dev is shocked. And meanwhile, we see Christopher Green at home, fingering an elephant. A jade elephant. But which not was, like that. Which was not his birthstone, but it was all that Bernie could afford, which, sure. So her story to Gemma and Paul here basically is that Christopher Green was her suitor. Yes. Not her son. secret baby. Yes. And then what happens, Gav, with the secret baby, Christopher Green, who looks nothing at all like Bernie? Well, for a start, he's nine feet tall. <laughs> there is that. It's like you kind of want to know what this other guy looks like. And obviously, obviously, they had to say this, that it was a one night stand that she had because... He could not possibly be both Bernie and Denny's child. No. Because Denny is also short. Yeah, as short as Bernie, pretty much. Yeah. If it's, their kid looked more like Ricky Gervais, I could have believed it, but... Yeah. It's hilarious because he looks nothing like her... Or Paul. Or Gemma. Because <laughs> Gemma and Paul obviously look like siblings, and they obviously look like Bernie and Denny. Paul and Gemma do kind of look similar. I yeah. think they've got similar eyes. Yeah, and Gemma very much could be the younger Bernie. Yes. It's it's hilarious that this is the guy they got to play Bernie's son. But, it feels like they all failed high school biology. Yeah. They they skipped over the part where that monk was doing research with peas. What was the name of that monk? Pea monk? No. <laughs> That's the second reference to peace tonight. No, that's like the ninth <laughs> reference to peace tonight. I'm just... Okay, so this isn't retconning anything because we didn't know ben, Bernie at this point. Right. She could have been up to anything. Right. Her days at the Hacienda. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Right. So it's quite conceivable. And we that, know that she was a very... She was not a great mum. No. To them to begin with, because when she first appeared on the show, Gemma and Paul treated her basically the same way they treated Denny when Denny showed up. Exactly. Which as, is kind as, of hilarious. As per Chicky's point. Yeah. So it's not retcon as such, but what I kind of take, in fact, it's not retcon at all, but what I kind of take exception to is she hasn't been looking for this kid. No. Before. His whole life. She started looking yeah. recently, Yes, I'm going to say, in the last couple of days. Right. And she finds him almost immediately. It's not that hard. Facebook exists. Christopher Green. Yeah. Of a certain age. So, like, she can immediately cross out. And who apparently was adopted out to someone fairly close in the area. It's not like Abby's twins. No. More on them later. <laughs> See when you say Abby's twins. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. On Wednesday, Dev goes to Nina's Rolls to see Bernie. Uh, see if you hadn't mentioned all those porno ma Anyway, on Wednesday, Dev goes to Nina's Rolls to see Bernie and she tells him about a run-in with another Christopher Green who was in his 80s. That doesn't seem to be her son. No. She can't bury it until she gets some closure and she's down to her final name on the list. And later Which on is Christopher rollers, Green. Bernie reveals that the final... <laughs> Do you think she just had a list of Christopher, Christopher Green, Green, Christopher, Christopher Green, Green, Christopher Green, Christopher Green, Christopher Green, Chris Green, Ooh. Christopher Green, Christopher right. Green, Christopher spelled with a K, 
Christopher spelled with a C. Christina Green? Question mark. Green spelled with an E at the end. Green spelled without an E at the end. Yep. Later in the Rovers, Bernie reveals that the final Christopher Green died of cancer, and this just upsets Bernie even more. Dev tells her not to give up hope, as she doesn't know this Chris Green was her boy, but Bernie has a feel in her water. No, Bernie, that's a UTI. She heads back to work and runs into the other Christopher Green, who thinks that she's following him. She's like, I work here, asshole. She thinks he's following her. He claims he's there on official business, and she threatens to call the police. But he says, there is no need. I am, I am the, the police. police. And he arrests her for being drunk and disorderly because she's had a couple of beers. What a dick. Swain. So at the cop shop, DS Swain can't believe this shite and gives Christopher Green a bollocking and sends Bernie on her way as Bernie loudly says that her poor boy is dead and she'll never get to know him. Swain. So Swain kind of suggested that this PC Christopher Green or or DC Christopher Green was fairly new to the area. Yes. You know, these antics might cut it in Capital City. Right. But you're in Weatherfield now, bud. Right. And you play by my rules. Yeah. This, this may have played well in Gotham, Batman, but not here in Metropolis. Right. Swain is Superman. Yes, she is. And Christopher Green is Batman. Yeah, she's not taking any of this shit. You can't be arresting Bernie just because she's had a, had a drink. Right, yeah. And so, and she called you names. You poor, poor little baby. Yes. So on Friday, Bernie was up all night fretting about Zodiac. It's an intense grief that she's feeling about this. Practice for when Paul finally kicks the bucket with a little bit of a payback thrown in for good measure. Dev promises her it'll be okay. Christopher Green is back on the street to apologise to Bernie later. She threatens to complain about him, but he's had a look at her record and knows that she's not whiter than white herself. Bernie says that she had her reasons, and Gemma and Paul see this interaction from across the street and are curious who she was speaking to, but she quickly deflects and says it was just a busybody asking about racist Kelly. Paul later has some bad news for them. This will be his last supper before his feeding what? tube is yeah. fitted. First he just says, this will be my last supper. And it's like, holy shit. This is how he's going to tell them that he's going to do assisted suicide tomorrow? Mm-hmm. And then it's like, no, 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 no. Don't worry. It's just a feeding tube. And it's like, don't. Just a feeding tube? <laughs> he tells them this with his speaking tablet. And it's just so sad. It is. But he's relieved because swallowing is just so tough for him these days. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Later, Christopher Green is in the Rovers and meets Gemma, figures out who she and Paul are in relation to Bernie and to him. And he's about to leave without drinking his pint when Bernie comes in and they awkwardly have to sidestep each other as he leaves. Right. And that's as far as we get with that And he leaves. He leaves abruptly. Because he figures out that he's younger than Gemma and Paul. Right. Which, yeah, I'd probably leave too and have mixed emotions that my mom gave me up, but not my older siblings. Oh, yes. Yeah. But he's seen Bernie. He's seen her. He must know she did the right thing because he lives in a proper house. (laughs) <laughs> and his name isn't Zodiac anymore. It's a, it's a proper house that doesn't have a fridge in the living room. Yes. He hasn't even seen the fridge in the living room yet. Oh, wait till he sees that. <laughs> so aye, aye, so aye. he knows that he was adopted then. Yes. And he knows that that's his real mum. Yes, because we see him take the elephant out of the drawer. Mm-hmm. So he knows. And why else would he do that? Right. Why else would he have that still? Because obviously his adopted parents would not have bought him a jade elephant. Well, I'm glad that we're getting a little bit of fruition of this secret baby and the secret baby storyline because... And this secret baby isn't dead. Because in the Toya one, it still doesn't amount to much. She nope. mentions it as a reason for being maybe a little sensitive and a little emotionally fragile, but... 
it might as well not have happened. Right. But here at least there is a enormous uh, proof of of the the outcome of that, I guess. Although I do find that when it comes to Toya, I I, I do kind of feel like the way she's attacking, the way she's trying to protect Leanne. Well, we'll we'll get to that. Next right, story. which we'll we'll get to, is kind of in part due to the dead baby in the park under the rose. Well, maybe that's just an, an easy connection to make. And if if that hadn't happened, maybe maybe it still would am- amount to something that was kind of believable. But this uh, Christopher Green thing, it's interesting that he's a copper and... A giant. A, a giant copper from Lilliput, <laughs> who clearly knows that Bernie's been on the foul side of the law quite frequently. That's who Bernie's one night stand was with. It was Andre the Giant at a WWE British tour. Hmm. That would work. He kind of Merchant. He kind of has a a, He kind of has has Andre's nose and coloring whereas Stephen Merchant is a ghost. Andre the Giant's a real ghost though. Well, yes, now. Oh, too soon. So, uh, yeah, the, I don't know. The, this featured quite a lot this week, and and I, I guess it went somewhere. Mm-hmm. I just it's uh, progressed. It's progressed into something, but I'm not entirely sure where we're where we're going to go with this. But we do have this little conflict again that we kind of warned about a couple of weeks ago where Bernie's getting ready to say goodbye to one son while getting to know a new one. And yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm not sure that the Paul storyline needs that or if that's doing right by the Paul storyline. Yeah, I don't know. This kind of feels like it may be a kind of nice thing. You know, she's losing one son and she's gaining another sort of thing. Which I guess is kind of nice, and maybe, maybe a blessing. Because remember what Paul said about Denny. You know that it's towards the end of his life, and you know, and he wants to try to solve some of these things in his life. So, who knows? Maybe, and maybe this might be a comfort to Paul as well. To have, to have Christopher back in their lives and be a comfort to his mum when he passes. I don't know. We'll see. It's not really back in their lives. Sort of back in their lives. They were. They, they, were, they, were, they were. two. They weren't aware of him. No, which is also kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, they were two and a half. I have like vague memories. Oh, I remember nothing be- before five. I have very maybe v- something at four. Yeah, it's like very vague, kind of like fleeting, just imagery. Yeah, I, but you'd think that they would remember a baby. If no one reminded them of the baby, then I can see them forgetting it. Yeah. So Paul seems to be getting ever so closer now to death. To yeah. Yeah, it was very disconcerting because we hear him talk earlier, and then all of a sudden he's using the keyboard. And it's like, why? Why is he? Why is he using the keyboard? We well, haven't he, had a scene where he can't talk anymore. Why is he using the keyboard? Well, it was saying a lot. I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's tiring them out. Yeah, it's possible. But yeah, that's that was a that was a rough one, and he seemed to be taking it pretty well. And even Gemma and Benny kind of were taking it well and, and trying to make light of it. But it's like, oh dear, a feeding tube. It feels very much something yes. that's happening towards the end, doesn't it? Yeah, and the fact that he's grateful for the feeding tube. Yeah. Ugh. So sad. All right, we'll move on then to Steve's Demi Semi. On Monday at the cab office, Steve is in high spirits with plans to have lunch with Demi at the Bistro thanks to the uh, input of Tim last week. But his mood is shut upon when he sees that Tim is reading an article about how Weddy County are looking to honour Tommy O by renaming a stand and commissioning a new bust... So during his meal with Demi, all Steve does is complain about Tommy O and reveals that he stole Tracy from him. Demi doesn't really give a shit and fucks off after dessert, claiming that she has an important email to send. 
Steve doesn't reckon that he'll see her again, even when she says that she'll be in touch, probably by email. Right. And he doesn't... To say that she'll never see him again. And he doesn't seem to care either way. He seems a little bummed. He seems very resigned that he's blown it. Mm-hmm. That beard's coming in nicely, though. It is, isn't it? Mm. And even more so on Wednesday, because I... I actually note it on Wednesday. <laughs> and in the roles, Dev is giving a bearded Steve some advice about getting over Tracy first before he starts pegging someone else. Dev, the voice of reason? I know. Steve claims to be over Tracy, but then is apoplectic with rage when he sees her Insta post where she's paragliding with Tommy O. And apparently couldn't even get Tracy to go in the teacups at the carnival. And here she is paragliding. Steve unburdens himself to Tim and mentions Dev's advice and Tim agrees. Tim somehow finds Demi in the precinct and sings Steve's praises as he picks her up as a taxi fare. She confirms that Steve's chat about his ex was a put-off, but she did like him. Tim secretly meets Steve in and the pub. And he has kind eyes. Yeah. And uh, Tim and Steve meet in the pub back-to-back, sitting in different booths like they're spies. Yeah, which is hilarious. Steve reveals that he's heard from Demi and they're meeting again after all. Once again, Tim to the rescue. Mm-hmm. He pretends to be surprised or really has forgotten what happened a few scenes ago. Mm. On Friday, Tim and Sally are in Nina's roles. He tells her that Demi is a real estate agent in Hale Barnes. And this gets Sally yeah. so enthusiastic. A luxury real estate agent. She lifts the ban on Tim and Steve's friendship. Of course she can see each other again. Maybe we should all see each other, she says. And they rush to meet up with Steve and Demi outside the pub in Demi's fancy AMG Merc convertible. Yeah, she's making plenty of coin. They're just back from indoor skydiving. Sally wants to have dinner together and gets an invite to Demi's, but Steve says that he'll cook at his place. And he'll even invite Ken along as well. Sally's a bit crestfallen about this. So Steve goes to Dev's for ingredients, apologising for not inviting him and Bernie, and Dev honestly doesn't care. And there's more concern that Steve tagged Demi in his social media photos Mm because he done that to Asha one time and she went absolutely fucking rage about it. Yes. Of course, a daughter is different from a romantic partner. Steve is sure it'll be fine. So at this point, we know that it will not be fine. And then without Ken. Sally's bragging about her house and her hot tub and conservatory and how she has an LBGTQ plus daughter. Yes. Tim and Steve secretly would love it if their women folk became bezies. But then Demi seems put out when Steve posts a picture of her and Sally and she passively aggressively confronts Steve about his obsession with the socials and then makes her excuses and leaves while Sally continues to act posh, which annoys Tim. And that's as far as we get with that this week. Yes. Sally was hilarious. Right. She was. She was peak Sally. Peak Sally. The second that she hears about the real estate right. in Hale Barnes, because that's where she was looking to move mm-hmm. and fancy le- fact, leafy Cheshire. The fact that, you know, she's claiming that, that her house is on the right side of Coronation the Street. The posh side of the street, yeah. Yes. And that the best part of the day is looking out, or the best part of the other side of the street's day is looking out. And being able to see Sally's house. It's like, really? Well, she lives in a semi-detached. Yes. It's all terraces on the other side of the street. But still. And she's Come got on, a, Sally. She's got a bigger garden. She's got a conservatory. They're, they're definitely the newer houses. Right. Yeah. But Sally sits at a sewing machine right next to people who <laughs> live on the other side of the street. Yeah. You know? Not the one concerns sally at all it's it's hilarious and you know we haven't really gotten to see this side of sally in a while so it was nice to see it back again it's funny because in classic cory at the moment she's uh, very much been the 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 terrible posh mum. she's got kev absolutely broke pain for rosie's schooling at oak hill oak hill and and they've recently just met Sophie's friend's parents, who Sally is about to have an affair with. Ooh, with both of them? No, just a just a, oh, man. Just a fella. <sighs> Damn it. She's a car salesman. This is just as disappointing as challengers when it comes to thruples. <laughs> right. But uh but th- but that 
from 2004 right. is very much in line with the Sally from 2024 that we're seeing here this week. It's just so good. She just turns it on. It's hilarious. So so effortlessly and You're right. and, how, and yet so thickly. And how disappointed she was when Demi says that she just makes cheese on toast. Mm-hmm. And Sally's like, oh, so you didn't make this? What was it they were eating? I, I don't I can't know. remember. Something, something fancy with a foreign name. Yeah, but Steve made it. Steve made it out of a packet. Right. But she was loving it when she thought that Demi made it. Right. And then when she finds that Steve just made it, it's maybe not quite so good. That's, that's very binary of you there, Sally. Yes. Which is shameful considering that your daughter is a member of the LGBTQIA plus community. Yeah, I don't think Sally mentioned I. Or A. No, she just said LGBTQ plus. Did she even get the Q in she there? She did get the Q in there. Q plus. Mm-hmm. So intersex and asexual people mean nothing to you, Sally. They can get the fuck as really? far as Sally's concerned. How dare you? She would piss on them if they were on fire. <laughs> Unless it was New Year. And they, <laughs> and were, they were flowers. In bush. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Sally really made that. And Sally really made Friday's episode. Because you're right, there was an awful lot of really heavy, heavy stuff going on and and stupid stuff going on. Sally was a bit of a, a, ray, of, a ray of light. I do yes. like Demi. I do too. I do, do like Demi. There is something about her still. Right, yeah. That she's not really wanting to be on Steve's socials. So maybe she does have a fella somewhere else and doesn't want doesn't want this to be broadcast all over the place. Who knows? There's there's definitely something about her though. And good for Tim helping out his friend and Yeah, and getting his friend back. And getting his friendship back on track again. Good stuff. The next storyline is reality coding bites. On Monday, Indina Rolls Toya is researching the Institute online and has found a forum of former members that shocks her to her core. Shocked! And she rushes off. She heads to the bistro to show Leanne her evidence that a female member has stated that the Institute is a bunch of weird fuckers. And she can't find the post online now, though. What? Seeming it must have been taken down for legal reasons. Yeah, yeah, because that happens that quickly. Yeah. Yeah. People that run these forums really care about Legal reasons. Legal consequences. Right, yes. And, you know, the Facebook AI that is alerted when you make a complaint like this, it works this quickly yeah. to look at things and, you know, and then take down your post on Marketplace beca- for selling live animals when it's just a teddy bear. Oh. Fucking sucks. Anyway, it's weird how you said, Is that what oh, you're doing just now? No. You're selling teddy bears just now on your phone? No. The way you said, oh, was really funny. You're like, oh, teddy bears. Not a teddy. Leanne is embarrassed <laughs> for Toya here and just wants her to drop it. Leanne speaks to Rowan online and he tells her that the post was made by his ex. He changes the subject to tell her about his promotion and he'd like to celebrate with her and his new boss at the Rape Hotel. Right, which... I thought he was the head of this cult. So did I. So I'm confused. And also, I guess now it's going to be a woman's name that will be tattooed on Leanne's vagina now. Because his boss is a woman. Did we get a name? It's something weird like Skylar or something. So that's longer than Rowan then. I think per character is really how we're judging this. <laughs> yeah. If her name was... Christina Lewinsky. <laughs> Oof. But I don't think R- I Rowan don't... Barr might be a bit easier. Yeah. Or maybe it's just initials. Who knows? Depends how much room I guess Leanne's got. Mm. So Leanne is made up and ropes Nick and it going along with. Afterwards, Nick is singing the praises of Rowan and Willow. It was Willow. Willow. See, I knew it was like a weird flower child name. And the presentations. He thinks it was very good. When Leanne nips off for a shite, Toya wants to know the real tea. And Nick admits that he was using his acting skills here, but it wasn't as bad as he thought it was going to be. They're just nice people. He's yeah. got to dial down the criticism and suggest that Toya does the same because Leanne hasn't been this happy since Oliver. Yes. But Toya does not do the same. It's so funny how he says it, though. He's like, she hasn't been this happy since the before. 
Oh, no, he said Oliver. He did. The before. He didn't say that. Rowan turns up at the bistro to invite Leanne away for a two-week retreat. Leanne doesn't think she can leave the business and her responsibilities, but from privately, Rowan tells Toya not to spoil Leanne's happiness. On Wednesday, in the bistro, Leanne has found someone from the Institute to help Simon with his business idea. Toya's sceptical, but Nick thinks Jared sounded well clued up in the app game, so Simon agrees to meet Jared at the seminar tomorrow. He asks for Hopefully a Hopefully not Jared from Subway. He asks for a sub to pay for it, which gets Toya's knickers in a twist, so Leanne gives him some extra shifts. Nick, though, suggests meeting at the bistro, because that won't cost them any money, Right. but that doesn't fly with Leanne. Right, she's like, how dare you? This man has already agreed to take time out of his busy schedule to steal $200 from us for him to talk briefly to Simon about his takeaway business. His stupid takeaway delivery app idea. Right. Meanwhile, Toya nicks Leanne's tablet and sneaks out and she goes home where she's about to call someone she's found on Rowan's Friends Connect when Nick comes home. Toya's disappointed that he's Team Rowan now, but he reckons the Institute are all right, and besides, he can't be bothered being upset about any of it anymore. Toya agrees to meet Rowan's ex at Speed Dal, but the ex, when she meets her, can do nothing but sing Rowan's praises and reminds her that Leanne is an adult and she's capable of making her own choices. <laughs> this obviously isn't what Toya wants to hear, so she goes a bit loco. This is not the woman whose comment was deleted yesterday. No, it's obviously not. Also, Toya... You found this woman on Rowan's Friends Connect. If they're still attached on the Friends Connect, this is not the ex you're looking for. Yes, this is an enemy's connect. Toya, you're smarter than this. Later, Rowan turns up at the bistro and has obviously spoken to his ex-wife. When Toya comes in, Rowan gets all new age and lets everyone know what happened. What a fucking rat, says Toya. And she tells everyone to suck on her hairy balls. Leanne is fucking furious and sends Toya home. I will speak to you later. Yeah, go home. Nick speaks to Toya and says her actions are just pushing Leanne further and further away. Toya is worried that this is what the Institute is doing. Leanne comes in and doesn't have any space to absorb her negativity. So she's fucking off to the retreat after all. Maybe y'all can suck my hairy balls now, she says. On Friday... Leanne is packing various perfumes for a retreat. Nick has finally decided to be jelly about this now when he learns that maybe this Rowan character is going to be there after all. Toya begs her to stay. She needs her sister. Leanne, though, is happy to go sans phone. Yeah, that's not a red flag at all. And with that, she leaves. And at this, Simon stumbles out of his room and learns that he's covering for Leanne at work. So, oh, jeez. And also that yet again, a parent has left him for an extended period of time without saying goodbye. Yeah. Without saying goodbye. Despite the fact that he was in the flat at the time. Right, yeah. Nick's like, oh, we thought you'd gone. And Simon correctly says, you didn't think to check? <laughs> yeah. I, I do not blame Simon for what happens next. These people are terrible to him. <coughs> it's like he's walked out of his room and they've got Au revoir, Simon decorations up <laughs> with a big arrow pointing to the door. This is how we're treating you now. Fuck off. Right? So Simon goes to work and during his break he gets wired into the booze again. Looks like he's an alky now. When Nick protests, he fucks off the rovers and later we see him pissed with a chippy looking for a taxi into town later. Tim is reluctant to give him a ride, but eventually does. Meanwhile, Nick is worried that Leanne's got the hots for Rowan as she's taken three different types of perfume to the retreat. <laughs> Maybe Rowan tells her what she wants to hear. And then Tim comes in to let Nick know that Simon has puked up in his cab and legged it without paying. Nick thought that he'd got over the alcoholism and he and Toya head into town. To yeah, but then the, parent, the parents in his life emotionally abused him again. Yes. Leanne turns her back for five minutes and this happens. They find him passed out at the precinct, about to be robbed, and they take him home. And Nick tries to Not call... about. They took his wallet. Yeah, but it was also pointless because he There's immediately no got money. it back. They, care, they carry him home and Nick tries to call Rowan to get a hold of Leanne, but... He's not answering his calls either. Nick is losing it. Why is his life changing so much? Why is this all about me? Shouts Nick. And that's as far as we get with that this week. Yeah, he does kind of shout, why is this all about me, doesn't he? Just a little bit. It's like, 
Did did you stop to think why maybe Simon is acting like this again? Did you ever stop to think? Even Toya doesn't doesn't connect. Oh, he's like this because another parent has abandoned him. Even she's not figuring that out. And she's supposed to be the empath here. Yeah. Why well, is just Simon though? Doesn't matter. He's emotionally stunted because like his actual mother was murdered by a train falling on her. No. Isn't that his mother, the one that the train fell on? No. She's not the hairdryer one. No. What did she die from again? I think it was breast cancer. <laughs> but she died in Australia. Right. So she'd already abandoned him. No, he was with her. She abandoned him in death. And then he was shoved off to these people who have never cared about him. Was it breast cancer? Let me just quickly check that. Lucy. It had to have been something more interesting than that. No offense to people who have breast cancer. It's quite remarkable because my timeline in my head here of when this happened in the show is kind of mucked up. She was played by Katie Carmichael who played Twist and Spaced. But that happened before she was in Corey, and I would swear it happened afterwards. She, yeah, breast cancer. Yeah. Young adults still need, even even adults our age need love and affection and for people to care about and their And when they don't get it, they turn to booze. If they're alcoholics... They probably do. But Simon sometimes. was Simon was cured of that. Remember, you, because he went on the course. That doesn't that 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 puts it in remission. That makes you a dry drunk. That does not. There's no cure for alcoholism. He went on the course. He was fine. He was being cheery with Sam. And then he was abandoned again by a parent. So it's, there was a trigger. So it's back on the imported beer and the mini bottles of red wine for for Simon then. I don't know. Poor kid. He's still a very young adult. Let's let's not sugarcoat how emotional 20-year-olds are or people in their 20s are. Especially men. You get to the point where you just say, Leanne, this is... You've made your bed. Go for it. I will be there to support you if you need it. And just let her go and make these mistakes. Right. Because trying to get her to not do it is just making Mark worse. It's just worse. pushing her in. Mm. The problem is, is that it's not just her money she's shoveling into the Institute. So Nick has to create a separation between right. the business money, his money, and her money. Yeah. Your and wages go here, my wages go there, the business account goes there. That's not going to go very well. I don't think. Well, it seems fair if it's something that's like super expensive like that, because he can't be expected to pay for her. No. Looney juice. Although she did say that she paid for his his gym membership that right, time. That, so. Yeah, his gym membership comes out of the business account for some reason, so her Looney juice can come out of that too. I don't know. I just think that it's it's obviously making matters worse. Yeah. I like I like that it feels like we've kind of accelerated more into cult territory where it's not just her sitting talking over Zoom to this dude and buying vitamins. Yeah, we've got a retreat happening. We've got a retreat happening and there's also a meeting with a higher up. So, you know, we're we're getting into the pyramid scheme part now. I wonder if the show hadn't kind of made a big deal about this cult thing and, and kind of spoiled it ahead of time if I'd be thinking that this was a cult I'd, I'd think oh, I'd think I it was a scam I don't know that I'd think it was a cult I would because an awful lot of the language used like uploading and stuff is is very much language used by modern cults like Nexium and some other things that you're in your Nexium, if man. you call them a cult your life is in danger I don't know. I think I think I'd I think I'd still probably be on the the side of yes. This is a this is a an organisation that's trying to fleece her of her money. I probably wouldn't think that she was they were trying to brainwash her yet. 
Maybe. Maybe not. He's Hard talking about uploading her brain and the power of positive thinking and all that other bullshit. Yeah, that doesn't very scream cult culty. to me. Yeah, it's very culty. No, it doesn't scream cult to me. Well, it screams cult to me. Mm. She's off for two weeks. I wonder I wonder if there's going to be a marked change in her when she comes back. There'll Maybe be she'll a, be like a space child or something. There'll be a marked change she'll, on her vagina. She'll shave her head. And, uh, Wearing Nikes and, and sweatpants. And she's got a Made in Manchester tattoo around her belly button. She'll be waiting for the hell bop comet. Yeah, she'll have a wait. Because that's been gone. All right, our next storyline is sell your fucking house, George. <laughs> on Monday, Michael and Glenda are chatting in the rover. She appreciates his advice. Thank you, Michael. Michael, though, has troubling news about the cost of legal action. That This is... This is becoming annoying because it happens in another storyline. Right. Somebody goes somewhere for legal advice and the legal advice that they get from DD is, now it's going to be expensive. Right. So Glenda gets a call from George and they meet up in Undertaker's where George presents her with a cheque for £22,000 that he's pulled out of his arse. And he apologises for everything that he said yesterday. We basically called her a bomb scare. Right. And, and responsible for... For her own abuse by the... the by the... Th- Burglars. Yes, at the Rovers. Hopefully now she can afford to buy little big shots. Glenda accepts, although she's not looking too pleased about it, but George is relieved. He tells Todd, who is pleased to hear it's all been sorted out, but meanwhile Glenda is off telling Michael that she's going to use that 22 grand to sue George for the Undertakers, as apparently that Estelle woman has had second thoughts and taken little big shots off the market. So Glenda is still out for revenge. <laughs> and that's as far as we get with that this week. Yes. So again, Michael and Glenda. Yeah. Maybe. Now, the only thing that they had in common before this was the fact that Glory went to the little big shots, right? Right, yeah. That's it. Yeah, I guess they are spending a little bit of additional time together. Right. Yeah, that's making me think of- about it. It kind of feels like the show's kind of trying to feel it out and and see what the response kind of is before they push it further. Yeah, I don't mind it. It might make Michael a bit more interesting. God, he's boring now, isn't he? Yeah, now that racism is off the table. Mm -hmm. Now that nobody's been racist. No, yeah. And he doesn't have an evil boss to scam him. He just has Carla. And I, I guess Sarah. And he doesn't, ha- doesn't have the business anymore. For he was making the, the onesies or whatever it was. Yeah, the, the mommy and me sort of outfits. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Where the hell is Ronnie? That's what I want to know. Why do we seem to be dropping Baileys like flies? <laughs> Dee Dee turns up, I guess, to tell people that legal advice is expensive from right. now and again. And, and we do see it a bit in the... And that she may or may not have news that might help Roy, but then again might not. Yeah. <laughs> and, and arranges a meeting to announce this. But anyway, yeah, Michael... Michael seems to be at a bit of a loose end, so maybe a relationship with Glenda wouldn't be... Wouldn't, wouldn't be, be the worst bad. thing. I, I wonder- do kind of like Michael, but he is, he is boring. Yeah. I wonder if that's what happened with the whole Mary and Brian thing, that it didn't test well... And so they just decided to drop it. Because that, that seems like that's been... Com- that's another thing the show has forgotten to add to the list. The fact that Mary and Brian were supposed to be getting in a relationship. And it's also forgotten about Italian Isabella. Well, she she went back to Italy. So, she so what ex- was that for then? So she doesn't exist anymore. She arrived. She was annoying. She left. Right. She was supposed. That's it. She was supposed to be the thing that pushed Brian and Mary together. I thought because it seemed like it made Mary realize that she had feelings for Brian, and then it just didn't happen. Just dribbled out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our penultimate storyline is Kev's first website. On Wednesday, poor Kev. It's time for the garage to be having financial difficulties now. Thanks to a new outfit who have nicked his corporate clients. Debbie tells him to be proactive and recommends he gets a website. And to that end, she enlists the help of former racist Max. Right, because everybody knows that Max is good with websites now because he was racist. Max has got a camera. 
And well, that's what Max is. And got. he's also good with websites. Uh, so yeah, so they get Max to take some action photos of Kev at work, which seems to be just taking a photograph of his arse. And he's going to build a WordPress site or something. Kev is worried that it'll look like he's selling lap dances, but Debbie thinks it's going to save the business. On Friday, Max shows the WordPress site that he's made for the garage, complete with comment section. He wants 100 quid for this quick mock-up. Kev thought 100 quid was for the lot, but Max wants a grand for the full site and the maintenance. Kev tells him to fuck off. At this, Abby gets a call from one of her nameless kids in Australia. It turns out they're coming over for a visit in three weeks, so that's exciting, isn't it, Helen? Yes. She's far too excited about that to worry about 100 quid for a website, so basically just throws it at Max. Kev says he's going to get Jack to build the website, but <laughs> Jack says, who do you think I am? Mark Zuckerberg? Jack is 46 now. Yes, and... And, and owns thinks, a tech company. And thinks that Facebook is a website. Facebook is a website. It's a, it's a social media site. Kev goes onto Jack's laptop and on the Weather County fan forum, he's shocked to see that ITV Corey is going to be in a documentary about a prison football team. And he's the coach. Back at the garage, Max comes back to renegotiate his fee. Kev isn't keen to discuss when a guy appears, overhears this confrontation and then leaves in disgust. Abby demands to know what's got him in such a terrible mood. And in the pub later, Kev has confided in Tim and Sally, who think he should come clean. Kev pins his Because she's going to find out about it anyway. Kev pins his hopes on the show being on a channel that no one watches, like ITV. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's as far as we get with that. Right. And there's also this weird kind of exchange between Abby and Gemma, where Gemma kind of seems to ask Abby if she's all right, as if she's kind of as if she's already seen this thing that Abby hasn't seen. Oh no, Gemma's just too caught up in the whole Paul and her mum thing. I think I don't think it was anything to do with that. Yeah, this fit, and and this is what I'm talking about with like the trauma dumping. It's like we already have the who done it. Mm-hmm. That we're still very much involved in, involved in, where a girl might be dead somewhere. We have the return of villain Nathan, who may or may not be involved in that story about a girl maybe being dead somewhere. Mm-hmm. We have Paul dying. We have dead baby. Oh, oh we have dead baby. We have Leanne. Joining a cult and neglecting her children who are still alive, which would be one person named Simon. Although I guess she's neglecting Sam as well, although we haven't seen Sam in a while. Where's Sam? And now and now we have the return of yet another villain. Yeah, this is about that's getting me as the villain returns. Right. ITV Corey, who's going to be doing this this stupid documentary because apparently Apparently, they allow soccer balls in prison now instead of just, you know, good old fashioned basketballs and hoops. Um, I know I'm thinking American prisons. Ignore me. I'm trying to be funny. Um, It's just it feels like. It feels like too much, especially since this is also going to be very traumatic for Nina as well. Nina who already has a lot of trauma because the one family member she still has has been wrongly thrown in prison without a conviction Mm -hmm. for something he obviously didn't do that they only have very thin circumstantial evidence for. So it feels like nobody's getting any sort of relief on the street for any of this. I don't pay very much attention to EastEnders, and I don't watch it. No. But it's been getting an awful lot of good ratings about the and 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 good feedback about the storyline of the six, and you know to the the tail end of last year and into this year, it's been all all that people are talking about soap wise mm-hmm. as as how good EastEnders is. Yeah. But all EastEnders seems to be doing, as far as I can tell, and I'm more than happy to be wrong about this, is to just bring back old legacy characters 
that get the member berries going and get the nostalgia a flowing. I'm mm-hmm. sure there's more to it than that. But right. from someone outside looking in, all I keep on seeing is people that are coming back that I remember from when I watched EastEnders 25 years ago. Right. It feels like Corey's trying to do this as well, mm-hmm. but is doing so by bringing back the baddies. Right, yes. We've got Nathan back. We're, I presume we're going to see ITV Corey. Right. And there was another name that was mentioned in some spoilers as well that I'm not going to mention. Right. We got, that is also coming back. We so got the like, return of Harvey a little while ago. We We didn't know him, but like all of a sudden... You know, Paul and Gemma's evil dad shows shows up and, you know, and a family that's already severely traumatized gets more trauma. But it, it just feels like there's a reason Corey didn't get any BAFTA nominations. Let's just say. It kind of... It kind of looks like, oh, that's working over there by doing this. We must do that. Right. And they're bringing back old characters a little bit as well. Like, why is Bethany here? Mm-hmm. Why has Bethany returned? And it seems like there are some other people who may be returning that are, like, not baddies, necessarily. But, but yeah, it's like... It's like when we go to the movie theaters these days and... And all the trailers are for Bad Boys 3, Mm -hmm. Inside Out 2, yet another Planet of the Apes movie, a remake of Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. You know, it's all bringing back old things. And that's not enough. That's, That's not sustainable. And it's not sustainable for Hollywood and it's not sustainable for a soap opera. Especially since there's too many damn characters already. Yeah. They, d- they can't even give people who have a contract with them already enough FaceTime on the show. Right. Yeah, there's those characters that have been in it for years that we actually quite like to see and, and we don't. And instead we get lots of Nathan and we're getting presumably again ITV Corey, who if I never see again would be too soon. Exactly. So... Our final storyline tonight is Where on Earth is Racist Kelly? On Monday, Bethany is recovering from last week's excitement, but tells Daniel that she's going to let the police sort it out. Daniel thinks that she's brave, the bravest person he's ever met. She's so strong. So very strong. Definitely is for sleeping with him. In the pub (laughs) later, she hears Dee Dee tell Nina and Carla that she's had a breakthrough and is going to get her mitts on Racist Kelly's text messages from the Not Only But Also fans. This may prove Roy's innocence. But rather than mention Nathan to Dee Dee, Bethany continues to eavesdrop and keeps her mouth shut. She goes to the lawyer's office looking for Dee Dee later, but finds Adam, who tells her that she's welcome to hang around on her own in the law office for Dee Dee to get back. And Bethany immediately starts going through their files when Adam leaves. She panics when Dee Dee comes back and then asks her advice about suing the police. Dee Dee thinks it'll be expensive. So Bethany says, fuck that, and, and leaves. And also pointless. Because nobody wins against the police. Not nobody, not know how. Oh, they do. Oh, I forget this is a different country. And our previous show sponsors specialised in doing that. That's 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 right. I forgot about that. Yeah. They should come to America. But Dee Dee isn't stupid and tracks Bethany down to Nina's roles where she loudly, in front of Carla and Nina, accuses Bethany of reading private and confidential files. Bethany decides now that she needs to tell Dee Dee about Nathan and going through his phone, and she claims that she knows his voice, so she'd be able to tell if those messages were from Nathan. Dee Dee says that she has a language ex- expert ready to do the analysis, and this puts Bethany's nose out of joint. She knows Roy or Daniel wouldn't misspell discreet, for example. Great. Back in yeah. the flat, Bethany's careful not to mention any of this to Daniel. Swain to Electric so, Boogaloo. <laughs> so Dee Dee goes to see Swain, who isn't as impressed as Dee Dee hoped she would be about this typo stuff and not being able to spell discreet. As far as proof is concerned, it doesn't cut the mustard. Dee Dee tells Swain to suck her balls and promises to speak to that expert. And, and yet, a condom wrapper and a broken chair 
are enough to throw Roy into jail. Yes. Yeah. What the hell? On Wednesday, every man on the street is wearing a grey hoodie. Just just so you know. Bethany is up with a lark and panics a bit when she sees Nathan or thinks that she sees Nathan on the street, but it's not. She goes to see her mum and David at number eight. Sarah tells her to let the police do their job, but Bethany doesn't buy Nathan's alibi, which is rich because no one knows what that alibi is. And next, she goes to see Craig and asks him about the alibi and corrupt PC Tinker once again ignores his responsibilities and tells her that Nathan was with his girlfriend at the time of the disappearance or whatever at his nail bar. And yet, right, yeah, and like a nail bar isn't suspicious, first of all. And second of all, it's hilarious because at first, Craig is very chuffed to see Bethany, who I guess hasn't spoken to him since she's been back. And uh, at, and she hasn't like, spoken to him since he's lost all that weight and has said nothing, nothing about, about it. it. And he's like, and she's like, oh, we should get a coffee or something. And he's really chuffed about it until he realizes he's, she's just using him for information. Yep. And she does not give a fuck about him. And that's why she hasn't been in contact since she's been back. She's not even and, discreet about it. Right. Yeah. No matter how you want to she spell it. She's terrible. Mm -hmm. She's a terrible person. She's worse than her mom. Then he tells her to leave the investigation to the police, but Bethany has already run off and isn't listening anymore. Meanwhile, Sarah runs into Gary at Nina's roles and tells her about the Nathan stuff and how unbearable this is making Bethany, and Gary makes a thoughtful face. We don't see Bethany quizzing the girlfriend, but when she's at the tram station, she and Daniel run into Nathan, who thinks that they're following him, and he knows about the girlfriend thing. Daniel goes to beat up Nathan, who doesn't look at all bothered until Gary shows up, at which point... Nathan jumps into his van and fucks off. And again, you would think that his parole officer and the police and the court would have specified to him that because he cannot be within 250 meters of this girl, mm -hmm. he should find a different place to live. Yes. Yeah, he shouldn't be anywhere near Weatherfield. No. While Gary, Sarah and David camp to the rovers to talk about what's to be done with the awful Nathan, Bethany and Daniel are back at the flat where Daniel is talking like a man who has taken one psychology class. He promises not to let Nathan hurt Bethany again, but she says it's too late because Nathan is in her head now, making her question everything. Bored with his platitudes, she goes off for a lie down. Meanwhile, Sarah is worried that she's going to lose Bethany again and this seems to spring David into some kind of action. Mm -hmm. And back at the builder's site, Nathan is on the phone to someone about how Bethany's family are all psycho nut jobs when a small behooded individual... Yeah, a small behooded individual... ...batters the fuck out of him. Yes, a very short individual. You were thinking Sam? No. Bethany goes to number eight to see Sarah for some reason and David comes in with jam on his jeans just as Bethany gets a call from Craig to let her know that someone has battered the fuck out of Nathan and he's in the hospital. Bethany rushes off somewhere while David looks shifty. Ryan finds Bethany in the community garden and she talks about Nathan being beaten up and she's worried that Daniel was the one who did it. Well, he is a bit of a psycho, says Ryan, and he mentions Daniel attacking Justin that one time. I don't think Bethany needs to be reminded about much of this because she was there when Daniel attacked Ryan that one time. Right, yeah. But apparently she didn't know about him attacking Justin. Justin, or even, Max, or even, Ken. Yeah, even though him. Justin, you know, of course he would attack Justin. Justin was talking his girlfriend, fiancé, whatever. Back home when she confronts Daniel about this, Daniel is fucking furious and demands to know who's been grassing them up. So Bethany tells him, and Daniel immediately goes round to the right. pub to demand a square go with Ryan. For supporting him and, you know, and praising him for attacking Justin, by the way. Ryan is approving of this. Yeah, and points that out. Yeah. And also says, I'm working. And also, I'm not 15. Right. Daniel lunges at him, has to be held back by Gary, just as the police come in. Meanwhile... David is doing his usual Wednesday afternoon laundry of everything he was wearing earlier that day. Slowly, Sarah becomes suspicious. You can't do your whites and darks together. And then she reckons that David was the one who attacked Nathan. David because there's jam on his legs. Yeah. David denies it, 
but is glad that it happened. Daniel's getting interviewed with Swain again. Daniel has his usual attitude problem with her and wants to know why people think that he's a thug. Well, because you are one, says Swain. Yes. And she demands to know if he blew the fuck out of Nathan. It's Swain too. And none of this... Electric boogaloo. And none of this questioning seems to last very long any time that Daniel's in because he's let out moments later yeah. without charge. But Bethany has had enough and leaves him for like the fourth time in three weeks. So on Friday... Bethany is now freeloading at Sarah's talking about getting Nathan in custody. Meanwhile, Shona is joining a list of people who think David probably kicked fuck out of Nathan. She demands his phone, and he demands hers in return. I'm not sure of the point of that. But anyway, Daniel goes to see Bethany and reacts badly when she still has doubts about his innocence, so much so that he's actually shouting at her in Sarah's house. Right, yeah. What the fuck are you doing? He's such a dick. Punk. Sarah asks him not to be an asshole, and he thinks he's been a good guy here. Good stuff. Later in the salon, David is furious at Sarah for blabbing to Shona, but then Shona has discovered that his fitness app puts David at the scene of the crime, so David has to admit that he was in the area, he saw the aftermath of the assault, but it wasn't him. But he knows who it was. Meanwhile, in the rovers, Gary is celebrating the sale of the factory. I'm like, who's he sold it to then? Carla. Uh, is it Carla? Yeah. Was that mentioned? Yes. I missed that bit. He advises a forlorn Daniel that Bethany will come round eventually. Daniel thinks Bethany's got sand in her vagina because he beat up Justin and didn't beat up Nathan. Yeah, that's the problem, Daniel. Right, well yes. Well done. Yes, she's jealous. She's jealous that Daisy had a stalker who threw acid at her. And you beat that guy up. That's exactly what's going on here. What? An asshole. Daniel asks Gary to have a good word on his behalf, what with Gary having a good relationship with Bethany still. So Gary goes to speak to Bethany, but before he can sing Daniel's praises, in comes Sarah with the bombshell that Daniel didn't attack Nathan, and neither did David. It was Gary. A tall person! Well, he's not that tall. He's taller than the person who attacked Nathan. It looked to me like it was David, didn't it? Yeah. I was like, oh, that's definitely fucking David. <laughs> David says that he saw him. Gary admits it, but claims that he never intended it to get brutal until he heard Nathan's phone call. Because Nathan was... Bragging about yeah. how he he was... How, how he sorted these people. Pure when, psychos. Right, yes. Bethany is furious and sheepish that Daniel is innocent. She accuses Gary of being a troublemaker rather than a solver and threatens to tell the cops if he doesn't and she storms off. Oh, Maria's going to love this, says Gary. Sarah tries speaking to Bethany, begs her not to tell the cops. Think of poor Liam. So Bethany, who I guess might know Liam, agrees. Sarah goes back to Gary to try and concoct a story to get Daniel off the hook, although she's a bit worried that Gary might have kicked fuck out of Nathan for her. Gary reminds her that he saw what he did. God, it's not all about you, Sarah. You and Daniel should be the two that hook up. Gary reminds her that he saw what he did to Bethany six years ago <clears throat> and they come up with a story of Bethany letting Ryan get into her head. Don't know why Ryan's getting thrown under the bus here. Right. So Daniel forgives her. Meanwhile, Sally goes to the hospital to see Nathan. Sally? Sally. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've got Sally written down here. Meanwhile, Sarah goes to the hospital to see Nathan. That would have been hilarious. I need to tell you about my toilet flushes. <laughs> no, it's Sarah that goes to the hospital to see Nathan. Why? It's just the, it's just the stupidest thing to do. Well, to threaten him, it's not apparently. Much, it's not to threaten him at all. It's to offer him money. Right. And Nathan, by the way, has got a bruise on his face and is in the hospital. Anyway, she tries to blackmail him with two grand to get him to keep Stum and leave town, and he reacts how you would imagine. He told the cops that he doesn't know who attacked him, but who knows what he might say when push comes to shove. He wants a proper payday, 10 grand. Back home, Gary offers to pay the 10 grand to make up for being for being the one who created this mess in the first place. But wait a second, Gary. That money is supposed to be paying for Liam's mental health. All of it? All of it. It's expensive. <laughs> it's surely sold the factory for more than 10 grand. Yeah, but still. Healthcare is expensive. 
Sarah reluctantly agrees, and this seems to bring an end to this. As but Nathan, of course, you can never tell Maria that I did this. As Nathan tells the police, it was an argument with a mate, so Daniel's off the hook, and the case has been dropped. Suspicious, though. Bethany nips out for some posh crisps, she tells Daniel, and she goes to see Sarah and asks how she did it, and Sarah is reluctant but eventually explains. Bethany is sick in her mouth and wonders why a lover boy would agree to pay Nathan off and wonders why Sarah can't keep her pie off another woman's bobby. Sarah scalps Bethany's jaw. I did it for you, she screams, and then she breaks down as Bethany predictably storms out. And that's how we end this week's episodes. Yes. There was a bit where Daniel had a fancy latte and a glass mug. Yes. And I posted on Twitter about it definitely not being an empty mug. Right, and uh, yet nobody drinks out of it. And Merlin Rice, a uh, director of Corey, uh-huh. replied saying, I bet they did that just for you. Oh, I was thinking that same thing, though. I was like, oh, we finally got them. <laughs> we finally got them annoyed with the whole empty cup thing. I, I think we are annoying them with it. Well, I'm annoying them with it. Yeah. Have we done an empty cup awards lately? Are we still doing that? I've been doing it consistently since 2021. Oh, okay. I'm not on Twitter anymore, so I guess I don't see it. You should post it on Blue Sky. You can't post a video on Blue Sky. You can now. Can you? I think so. You can do GIFs. You can post GIFs on Blue Sky it's now. Not the same. And DMs will soon be open on the Blue Sky. Oh, well. It's, it's a whole new world. Off. Yeah, because uh, the guy that plays George, Tony Maudley, replied to one of them saying, I promise you, there's liquid in those cups. And I'm uh-huh. like, no, there's not. No, there's not, George. <laughs> or at least it doesn't look like there is. No, because those cups have no mm. weight. So, why is Gary getting involved in all this? Because they can't allow people to be happy on the street and they must ruin every marriage. Because as much as I dislike Bethany, she's right here. Yeah. Sarah, keep your dirty pie off Gary. Right. Because she says to her, Gary's doing more for you than he's doing for his own wife. Right. Which maybe maybe it's not true. Truth a little bit, but. Because we do have the whole Liam thing and mm-hmm. healthcare, but it yeah it is weird and the way that he just like automatically was like yeah I'll do it, I'll cover it, and it's like you know you guys aren't in a relationship anymore and you turned her down for a kiss and that I was so grateful for right at the time because like that shows a level of maturity that you don't normally see um expect to see it and right. Gary but here he is doing the right thing mm-hmm. for the right reasons Yeah, maybe he shouldn't have been with Sarah in the first place right. alone but we'll yeah. let that go Right. but ever since then yeah, been a couple of hugs mm-hmm. some secret meetings Ooh. the startings of an emotional affair at yeah. the very least at the very bottom level and now he's throwing money at her yeah. and I'm no longer have that security about no. the Gary and Maria no. relationship and and I really like Gary and Maria together. It has improved both characters. Yeah, probably. I mean I always kinda liked Maria. She's gotten better over the years. But yeah, better with him, better the two of them together. Right. Stability. They seem to be together for the right reasons. I right. kind of mistrust of each other at its heart, but it was good enough for them to make it work. Right. Yeah, why why doesn't the show just break Kev and Abby up? That's that would make me happy. Be nice if like Kev had a heart attack or something. <laughs> that would be nice. I can make a website. Abby, 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 Abby come help me with this website. I'm a grumpy old man who doesn't understand the future. <laughs> yeah. At least they got rid of that coat. So. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> so we've got at the heart of it again. We've got Roy still in in prison, and still nobody knows where racist Kelly is. This feels like a big detour from that storyline this week. So it was a little frustrating for me. By the way, Kelly, Kelly, fantastic on the Doctor Who. Oh, really? She's doing a great job. I know people. There are 
mixed feelings about it. For yeah, I'm hearing a, a lot variety. of mixed about it. I was hearing quite a bit of praise for it last yes. week. It's very panto and very camp. So it's back to the good stuff. But right. I don't think a lot of people appreciate panto in their Doctor Who. Right. And it's like, shut up. Disney's giving us money now. It's fine. <laughs> Is it Disney money that's in that? Yeah. Yeah, because we watch it on Disney Plus now. We should get some Disney money into Coronation Street. That would be nice. <laughs> It's never going to happen, but it would be nice. That's the House of Mouse has come in to save Corey. Hey, it seems like they're trying to save the WNBA as well, because you can watch live WNBA games on Disney Plus now. We don't watch regular NBA, never mind WNBA. Yeah, well, maybe we should. Nobody watches basketball. So yeah, so we've got um, so we've got Sarah, who is uh, just stupidest person going to see Nathan right? just poking the bear and making matters a hundred times worse because while Gary was the one who was responsible for beating Nathan up the whole try to pay him off thing was just so ill-advised it's ridiculous and stupid and doesn't make any sense and what was she thinking just to make things worse yeah it does just make it worse it makes it so much worse because you, you know he's not going to stop at 10 grand. And poor Liam is never going to get to see a mental health specialist at this rate. No, or he's just going to have to bloody wait and see one on the NHS. Mm -hmm. Now, one would hope, or one would think maybe, that this whole debacle and his continued uh, request for his presence at the local police station mm -hmm. would be enough for Daniel to reflect on his personality and his propensity for violence. It hasn't happened yet. It'll never happen. Because this has been a, a great week for people holding up a mirror to Daniel right. and saying, this is what you are. Right. You You're lose terrible. your temper. You've got a terrible temper. You, you attack people at right. the drop of a heart. Yeah. Why don't you recognise this about yourself? Yeah. And... And really, why doesn't he? This is borderline personality disorder. It's just being a dude, isn't it? No. If you, if, if you say, well, why would I ever attack somebody? Did you know me to attack somebody? And then no. you can list off five people without thinking about it too hard. Then I'd have to go, oh, shit, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. But remember, we live in a world where the whole man or bear question has made more men angry and try to mansplain the fact that bears are dangerous to women as opposed to thinking wait a second why do so many women choose the bear are we the baddies i know you immediately said oh the bear without a doubt even i would choose the bear yeah the bear's not going to rape you no or you know mansplain things to you or gaslight you or rob you well if mansplaining is the worst thing that happens to you today no I mean, gaslighting can be terrible and emotionally jarring. But, you know, you, you get my point. There are a lot of men walking around the world who are exactly like Daniel, and they never figure it out. So do I think a fictitious character who has yet to figure it out will figure it out? No. I mean, he obviously hates women, first of all. Why they don't just say, you know what? Let's let's throw Rob about a bone and just make Daniel gay and it will solve everything because then he doesn't have to talk to women anymore. But I think he'd, he'd talk to his partner in exactly the same way. So he, he would stop being an asshole to women and start being an asshole to men. It, it's, an interest, it's an interesting prospect and I would love to see them you know, try it out and see what happens. They need to do but something with it because be, this, it's you, boring. Well, you, there's a reason why he's boring moment of the week more than any other character, except maybe his dad and Chesney. Oh no, it's, it's mostly Daniel. It is mostly Daniel. This, this whole character of being high and mighty and being completely unself aware of everything going on around him. It gets old very quickly. 
and, I would, I would and they really don't like, change it. I would really like to see it being addressed, and it felt like it was getting close to it. But it's he's able to dismiss it so quickly. And the thing that we're forgetting about all this is that he pretty much pushed Daisy up against the wall when they were arguing right. uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah. So it's not just the men that he is potentially being violent with. Right. He's potentially being violent with the woman who was supposed to be his wife. Yeah. And to have that thrust in his face and people basically explain this to him and it's still not It still not doesn't sticking. connect. I mean, I, somebody asked me if I thought he was badly written or well written. And I think he's consistently written. Yeah. But he's not a good character. He's consistently written, but it's a character that shows absolutely no growth. We, well, we've talked, we've talked, you know, we were just talking about Gary and Maria, two characters who have shown an awful lot of growth over the time we've even, over even just the time we've been doing this podcast. They've become different, better people, but it's been a consistent change where, where we're not saying, oh, wait a second, this isn't who this character is, you know? And, and it's kind of weird because Daniel isn't the only character on the street who never changes because Roy never really changes either. And no. yet we love him for it mm-hmm. because he's not beating people up or pushing them downstairs or against walls. Mm-hmm. He's being accused of it, which is kind of ridiculous because you would think of all of the people they're looking at, Daniel would be the more obvious one, but Daniel wouldn't evoke the emotional response from the viewers that Roy being thrown in jail has done. It's just because he is a consistently flawed character. It just, it feels like it doesn't work and don't get me wrong. I don't blame Rob for the way his character is written. Oh no, it's, it's, I have, it's perfectly well acted. Abs- the utmost sympathy for him because he has to do twice as much work as everybody else because of his tremor condition to be able to act. And, you know, so I, none of this is his fault. It's just, it's such a poorly written character and they don't seem to want to get him out well, of the I, cycle. Well, like, I don't know that it's, it's poorly written, but... I- like I said, I do think it's consistently written, but it's potentially interesting having a character who is academically bright and is able to quote Shakespeare and Dickens at the drop of a hat, but 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 can't read people, and and that that seems to be where he's at, right? And, and then has the the kind of the very short fuse that's that's thrown into that makes him quite a volatile right. character, but. He's the I, emotional. I think, I think where I would like to see some recognition from the show is is kind of just taking what happened this week a little bit further, and and have him have some kind of reflection on himself because he's missed being arrested for the murder so far. He's missed being uh, arrested for this assault, and fair enough. He, I don't think he's. He's killed Razor Skelly and he didn't assault uh he didn't assault Nathan, but Do you think Razor Skelly is dead? I didn't think so, but I could go either way now. It's been a long time. But but where he is now is he's a character who has enough reason for people to for him to be prime suspect, basically. Yeah. And that should have some effect on him. And it doesn't. And that's what I want to see. But I think the character is is consistently like this, but it has to get to a point where something is done about it. Right. Uh. Yeah, no. It's like it is it is like he is he's the emotional Sheldon Cooper of the street. Uh, yeah, that's crossed my mind as well as I was you know, ranting there. Be- because you know, because he can't re- he can't read people. But he also, because he can't read people, he doesn't just accept it kind of the way Sheldon does. He gets angry at those people mm. 
that he that he's not able to read them. It's like they could do so much with a character like that. He could be interesting, but they don't really explore that. I feel like we might be getting there. I feel like this might happen because when he was shouting in Sarah's flat mm -hmm. at Sarah's daughter. In front of Sarah. Who had left the room. Right. And is still shouting at her. Right. Uh, who had already removed him, herself from his place, <coughs> which is why she's in Sarah's flat. Mm -hmm. He's like, he cannot let her go. And there are so many times when people have said things to him this week where he just looks completely shocked and blown away that anybody could think X, Y, Z about him. That he's a thug. Right. Yeah. And it's not just Swain. It's Sarah. It's Bethany. It's definitely Bethany. You know, even Gary and Ryan are just kind of like, all right, mate, just settle down and let's talk about this. And you would think logical Shakespeare quoting Daniel would be the one to be to say things like, all right, let's calm down and think about this logically. Yeah. But he's not. But he's not. And that could be interesting, but it's not because it just goes in a loop. Yeah, that self lack of self awareness when they were shouting at Beth, I was like, I, I hope this is addressed. And the only thing that Sarah says is, I really should be telling you not to speak to my daughter like that. Mm -hmm. Something more needs to happen there. Yeah. I hope it does. I honestly didn't expect to be talking about Daniel quite so much in this storyline. No. But, but we did. We did. And that was the week that was Coronation Street. So tell me, Helen, what was your moment of the week? And why is it Sally? <laughs> yeah, it's Sally. Because Sally during the it dinner was, party, it was, it was the only thing that wasn't trauma dumping all week. It was the only spark of joy. Is the show remembering what Sally is supposed to be like? Yeah. Thank God to remember. Moment of the week. Moment of the week. Your boring moment of the week. Kev's website. <laughs> it was a dreadful photograph of his backside. Wasn't it, it? it was. It was. <laughs> it was hilarious. And there are aspects of that that were hilarious, like Max getting cheeky or Debbie saying, "Get down on the floor, and your little roly thing." And you get down. <laughs> yeah, I'm not getting on that. No one's going to believe. Not, no one's going to believe I can but, do that. But they really, with Kev, they really hammer down on the whole old man shouting at cloud yeah don't they one of these days they are going to have him shouting at a cloud the way he talks and the way he talks to young people you'd think he was older than ken i'd used to return uh, milk bottles to get money when i was your age and max was like i what have does no that idea even what you're mean? talking about kev's website is our boring moment of the week now on my yay mates this week, we've got 62.1% didn't hate the show this week, which is actually a pretty decent result. But I'm going to ask you, Helen, what your score out of 10 is. Four. It would have been a six. If they hadn't introduced the idea that ITV Corey is coming back, oh yeah, that, that kind that, of pushed that it, it. That kind of pushed it over to the other side of median. But six is what I'm going to give it this week. I thought it was better. I thought it, I thought it was all right as far as our heavy going week was concerned. But yes. yeah, I, I'm not going to argue too much about your your four. All right, then let's wrap this one up. This episode was brought to you with thanks to our friends of the podcast. That's Daisy, French Helen, Pickles, DT, Trisha, Wendy, Noel, Canadian Helen, Christy, Shandy, English Victoria, and Aurora Yvonne. Thanks, folks. If you've ever packed three different perfumes for a troubling retreat, write in to tell us about it. We're the talk of the street at gmail.com and we're at Corey Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and Blue Sky. 
You can shout me in hell on the coffee or become a friend of the podcast by heading to ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. Check out vogel.co.uk for links to merch store, YouTube channel and blog. And if you're so inclined, please leave a rating and a review on the iTunes or your podcast provider of choice. And be sure to check out our pop culture sister podcast, The List of Lists. We didn't do one this week. Oh, well. And her is long. Thanks for making it to the end of another episode. And we will be back next week with more. A talk of the street. The talk of the street. Bye. Cheerio.